Now this, the specification of the of the harmonics can be done in one of two ways. On one of my displays, I can uh, I'll, I'll show you them both in just a minute. In one of my displays, I have 32 sliders on the screen. There are, there are patterns of sliders, which I use the light pen to move up and down. I just put the light pen on the slider, move the light pen up and down, and the slider goes up and down on the screen. This, this is my handle on the controls and switches that the program gives me. Sliders is just one thing that, that I can move around with this. Waveforms is another. This is what I use to draw waveforms with. Another way of, of determining uh, the harmonic content of a sound is to draw the, amp the envelopes of each of the, amp of, of the um, harmonics. Those uh, graphs that you see there, the horizontal axis is time, vertical axis is amplitude, and those are actually how each individual envelope varies. You see the first eight harmonics there, the amplitudes are the first eight harmonics. Here's what that sound is. Again, I played it before. Now that has a, this is a, a, there was a lot of work that went into this sound. That thong attack is a very rapidly moving set of envelopes at the beginning and then, then it slows out and goes off in the distance. So you can, you can shape amazingly uh, complex sounds this way. And the way they're shaped on this page is with the light pen. Just get in there and draw them in. Here's the page with the sliders on it. No, it isn't either. I'm sorry. There are the sliders. Sliders are a bit more quantitative if you want to shape each individual cycle or a whole bunch of cycles at one time. Very precisely, you use the sliders. You can move those up and down with a light pen or if you want to say, I want 64.5 dB on this one, uh, you, you type in the appropriate number. It's, it's, it's an encoded number, but it's a number that where you can see the slider moving up and down as you type in that number and increment it by small quantities. <clears throat> so I've covered three, three separate ways of getting sounds into the machine and shaping them. The important thing is that the, uh, while we can think of them in three separate ways, they're not separate in the machine. Once the waveform is in and it, it, it's come from a microphone, it is the same waveform as if I made it out of sine waves. And I can splice together these waveforms, I can mix them, I can crossfade them, coming, coming up, uh, giving us the, the ability to put together sounds of limitless complexity. It's just the amount of work you want to put in, the amount of voices you want to assemble that determines the, the complexity. Now, of course, uh, I may be interested in spending a lot of time developing sounds. Other musicians may be more interested in, in composing those into uh, more, th more lengthy musical gestures. And to, and, uh, melodies, uh, whole pieces of music. Uh, compositions, to sculptural compositions, and so on. You always have the choice of taking something right out of your library and using it with nothing more than one command on the keyboard, or working out a little bit and storing that variation of the sound in the library, or spending all day working on it to get a completely new sound. You always have that option in any application. <clears throat> okay, um, I would like to end up by talking uh, about how one puts together whole pieces of music uh, with this. The digital sequencer I've already showed you. The digital sequencer receives its information from the keyboard. It remembers everything that is done by the keyboard and it can remember up to eight lines as much as 10 or 20 minutes of playing and, and 
uh, play those back at any speed without changing the pitch of what was put in. <coughs> uh, here's a very simple example. I'm loading in a voice now that was taken off an Oberheim sequencer, uh, synthesizer. Like I say, there's no point to being a purist about where you get your sound because they're raw material. Now, if I didn't like the attack on that sound and I want to make it stronger or shorter and get rid of it, I could do that, but I'm not, I, I won't. Uh, I'll just call up the, the sequencer for which this sound was gotten. simple example. Uh, the resolution is, is very high. It's, it's much higher than you can hear. That is the, the timing and the, uh, the key velocity go down with uh, the, the difference between when you play it and when you play it back is absolutely inaudible. We're dealing in milliseconds of timing. Uh, Now, off this disc, I'm going I'm to take our Rhodes piano sound. Take the disc out. Put our guest performer in. Guest performer happens to be none other than Mr. Hormel. Uh, Now say I, uh, I, uh, I, I had an, a musical application where I, I wanted to get some humor and I, I thought it'd be nice to have that tune but it'd be nice to get a little bit funnier than that. Uh, well, I have a couple of possibilities on this disc here. It's, it's... There's one. Okay, let's try that. You never know. want to sit right in, doesn't it? <laughs> the point is that if, if that's what you want, uh, and, and but let's face it, there are plenty of times when you, when you have to make music that's just that ridiculous, uh, that would take a, a sound effects crew a couple of days to put together normally. Uh, and here, not only doesn't it take a couple of days, but it's something you can try and listen to and just forget about it if it sounds too ridiculous or too this or too that. 